Disclaimer, we here at Middleside Topwise do not make leftist circle jerk content. At no point have we attempted to frame Tyler the Creator, Killer Mike, or even Rage Against the Machine as leftist revolutionaries. I've been involved with the hardcore scene for so long, and I love it. I love the kind of expression that goes on here. It's a fucking beautiful thing. But there's one thing I've always questioned about is that we all, me included, have done more to point fingers at everyone else than to really tackle the problems that exist in our life. This, de this defense effort is a real problem that all of us can tackle. All of us can become involved in it and use our spirits and our energy as people to help these people in their daily struggle against the government so that they can survive, so that they can exist. That's it, simply exist as a culture and as a people. We don't face those struggles every day. And I'm asking you, please, we paid the money, that's great. That money will run out. Get into this information. Become aware of indigenous struggles in this country and do something about it, please. The role of the artist is to observe and translate the human experience. Popular black artists who make even one political song are putting their entire livelihoods on the line. And we here at MSTW will go out of our way to highlight that bravery before criticizing anyone's personal business decisions. And just like those songs, the point of our videos is to introduce revolutionary concepts to the fans of these artists. We often feature black artists because, one, I've been studying hip-hop culture since I was five years old, and two, white leftists have simply not done enough to demonstrate a requisite understanding of the black American experience. Black power uh, is about even organizing African people who are engaged uh, in, in uh, selling resources, uh, selling things, or entrepreneurs as they are uh, often referred to can find a way uh, to engage in economic activity in the community with the intent of uh, taking back the community for independent econ African activity. They don't have to be communist, socialist, or anything to do to want that. They do want, as a part of the African nation, to control that African market so that uh, now that white guy who's there or anybody else who's moved into our community now uh, uh, run up against this wall of uh, African people who uh, engaged in an anti-colonial struggle, which means an economic a struggle for uh, the control of the economy in our own community, uh, fighting like hell to secure that and to secure that politically in terms of the relationship that we have with the people uh, who we are now uh, uh, able, who are brothers and sisters, who are also our market, uh, who are also our producers, uh, who are also our workers, etc. This is part of the Buy Black Power mission. This is part of what it does. It changes the political and economic configuration of the African community in the best possible way. Please do not speak to me like I'm your average white liberal who just jumped on the BLM bandwagon last year. It's a blatant mischaracterization. I was disrupting white spaces before you were born. The reason I say all this is that more than a few complete strangers got really mad at me when I said, black people flaunting their wealth is in itself an act of revolutionary anti-racism. What is this? It's a black man wearing a giant gold rope around his neck like a fucking trophy. Now, why do you think a black man wearing a gold rope around his neck like a trophy might inherently be an act of revolutionary anti-racism? Hmm? Do you really think I'm promoting diverse capitalism here? Big whoosh. I do not have white liberal guilt, nor do I engage in race reductionism. I have John Brown level race traitor rage, and I'm a graduate of the School of Hip Hop. I can show and prove. If you're a black person in America, your perspective on racism is invaluable. That said, many black people's lived experience has led them to believe that they must make money by any means necessary. Being black does not give you class consciousness. You are not a magical being. You taught me that. Hip hop, on the other hand, is a complex Discordian magical operation intended to subtly inject revolutionary messages into the public discourse, often employing absurd exaggerations of black stereotypes to make a point. I refer you to Screamin' Jay Hawkins for more on this method. Hip hop makes an absolute mockery of wealth accumulation. Capitalists live modestly, hoard money, and desperately fear losses. They don't spend it recklessly on items that immediately depreciate and claim to be able to make it all back the next day. Many people who make ignorant rap music are aware of this trope. I was a whack rapper. Like, I knew I was whack, but I was real. See what I'm saying? My realness overcame my whackness. Wait, you, you actually think in hindsight, you think in hindsight you were whack? But my favorite rapper is DMX, Nas, mm. KRS One. Yet, no one wants to talk about Robert Smith, the black billionaire hedge fund manager I mentioned who stole $200 million in charitable funds and divorced his lovely wife of nearly 30 years to marry a white Playboy playmate. Have you even heard of this guy? 
Because last time I checked, Rihanna and Beyonce combined have a fraction of this guy's wealth. And the petty discussion of their net worth is only feeding the capitalist machine you claim to be against. Also, what kind of quality analysis focuses on the decisions of one oppressed individual without eventually bringing up the systems that coerce them? How long can you criticize Obama for being a war criminal before bringing up big oil and the military industrial complex? How long can you criticize Jay-Z before talking about the US government's active dismantling of black communities in the 1980s with drugs and guns? Hip hop is a universal art form birthed in the wake of the civil rights movement by ancestor-educated, revolutionary-minded Pan-Africans. She accepts anyone who comes to the table with peace, knowledge of self, and respect for all. Infinite abundance and joyous celebration are her core values. She is inherently anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and queer. In this video, which will serve as sort of a prequel to a feature on the higher infinite power helping oppressed people, we will walk the fine line of appreciation, awareness, and appropriation. Snow? No, not that snow. But check her out, she's dope. Vamos a sacar la mugre. Vamos a sacar verdades aunque todos suden. A mí ya me vale madre, toda mi vida hablaron mal y yo no le hice nada a nadie. ¿Qué familia tuve? This snow is the Irish Canadian reggae artist who blew up the pop charts with his 1992 hit, Informer a song detailing his mistreatment by police and struggles within the criminal justice system. Darren Kenneth O'Brien was born in 1969 in the North York District of Toronto, a resident of the low-income housing project known as Allenberry Gardens. The highly diverse borough not only gave him perspective on many different cultures, but he soon found himself in many of the same predicaments as people of color, being equally poor and seeing petty crime as the only means of survival. What are some of the benefits of, of being as large as you are? The benefits is I don't got to steal or nothing no more. And I could like, you know... Is that what you went to jail for, stealing? No, nah, I never got caught for all that. I got caught for always like, you know, temp murders and all that stuff. I've been charged 28 times, 26 times. How many times has it resulted in you... Going to jail? I did about three and a half years. The first time I saw my video was in jail, right? So now the guards started seeing, oh, you know what I'm saying, he's doing... The guards started treating me different. The inmates started treating me different. When I went back to jail, you know what I'm saying? I got charged just a little while ago when I went back to jail. The inmates would look at me like, what's wrong with you? You stupid? You know, she, you know, preaching to me. You know, people in jail for murder or whatnot. Teach, what are you, stupid? Are you an idiot? You know, you got something. Is that, it really behind you, though? It is behind me. It is behind me. What, I makes, still, what makes you so sure? Because what's so, maybe it's just, so I got charged last week. Or not last week, but a little last, about Christmas time I got charged with two out of fifth to death. All right? Say that again. Two out of threat to death. I'm on it now. I got to go to court. What's two out of threat to death? Two utter, utter, utter threat. Like, I told you. I'm utter gonna threat to yeah, death. Yeah, I'm going to kill As you. As in attempted murder. Attempted murder is where you stab somebody and almost kill him. Utter threat to death. I just told somebody uh, I'm going to kill him. An Verbal. utterance, right. So that's how I know. Before, I would have just jumped on him and just started, you know, fighting. But now I'm like, oh, shut up. I'll kill you. You know what I'm saying? So I'm... You know what so I'm that's saying? progress. It's big progress. What a poor Irish kid from the projects with a criminal record can do that people of color cannot is get record producers to write him a chart-topping crossover reggae hit and market it to young white audiences worldwide. All right, I mean, the guy had help, but Snow is very much a real artist. His debut album, 12 Inches of Snow, represents the amalgamation of hip-hop, pop, and dancehall that he was known for at house parties around Toronto. In the vein of Yellowman and other Jamaican sing jays who take on the role of both DJ and vocalist, he wore his influences on his sleeve and humbly won over black audiences one room at a time. I've been on our city and everything, that was nothing. When I came <laughs> to Jamaica, I was like, I was going to bring down my goalie pads and my the mask and everything, I think they're gonna throw a bottle too. You know and I was like, oh. But when I got up there, I was like, I was nervous. And I told the crowd too, I said, um, kind of nervous and everything, you know what I'm saying? But the crowd loved it when I said that. There are some high points on this record. And some low points. But go listen to the song Creative Child, where he deviates from his adopted Jamaican patois to tell a story about his heritage and influences. I'm pretty sure the whole song is freestyled. Mega, mega breakdown, so give me the crown so I can flip as a lyric leaves a lip. I shoot with the gift, live like a 12 gauge, leaving in a daze, cause snow is in a rage. Adopted? Appropriated? I don't know. It's kind of cringy to watch, but he doesn't suck at it. It's not really something you can just fake. Master, she know the pants got spit like a pet. Her raptor, bench, her deal like, don't like that. She'll fast her motorbike fast. You ain't gotta get a bitch, pass her a raptor. White bitch go, but the blood like a wound. Pass your rooftop in the wind. When I win, when I win, I 
Oh my god, that's the worst thing to ever happen to Hip-Hop. Junior Reed respects him, as does Ninja Man, Half Pint, Buju Bantan, Beanie Man, Dave Kelly, and Sly and Robbie, who all appear on his second album, Murder Love, the lead single going number one in Jamaica. And it's not a pop crossover. His third album, which failed to chart in America, blew up in Japan, and he's had continued success abroad ever since. Did he use his white privilege to get famous making distinctly black-sounding music? Yes. However, Snow is not only a student of the art, but a victim of the many oppressive systems hip-hop and reggae music were created in protest of. He understands and identifies with the struggle portrayed by these black musicians, even though he does not face the same level of persecution. MC Shan is the Queensbridge native and co-signer to the White MC, introduced to him by Toronto DJ Marvin Prince. Aside from this foray into pop rap, MC Shan is known for two things, collaborating with the legendary Marley Marl on the track The Bridge, and his utter lyrical destruction at the hands of KRS-One. Fast forward to 2007, where a matured KRS admits that he felt pressured to seek out battles like this as a way to make a name for himself in the industry. Keep in mind that he was homeless at 16, and saw music as not only a means of expression, but a way out of extreme poverty. Okay, so I was nine years old when this song was released. It blows my mind that it was marketed to kids. Record labels literally just saw a guy who looked and sounded like a Backstreet Boy doing a Shaggy impression and went all in. Shaggy's Boombastic would not be released until 1995, but I'm fairly confident that I'm not the only kid who thought Snow was informing all the sexy ladies that he would lick their bum bums down. Turns out he's talking about shooting cops. Jamaican Patois is a Creole, or mixture of existent languages, developed by black people in the 17th century as a result of their interaction with British and Scottish slaveholders. It also integrates elements of the Akan language, spoken in Ghana. This is Bujubantan one of the most iconic voices in reggae music. As a young man coming up, our music somehow through the passage and through the pages of time lost the potency. Now, contrast that with this delightful Scottish accent. All we new followers are just a set. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm just over the moon. So, uh, I, I just can't, I'm lost for words. That video was five million viewers. On a changing, changing my life. Honest to God, and thanks to every single one of you what's following me. I I'm just over the moon, I can't thank you enough. There's a narrative poetry to this dialect that lends itself to elaborate metaphor and a creative arrangement of words and concepts. If a phrase seems cryptic or out of place, it's usually either exclamatory or figurative. So, a licky boom boom down is to lick a shot, boom boom is really just the concept reiterated, and down is of course where you go when all this happens to you. The rest of the chorus doesn't really use much slang, other than Snow calling himself Daddy, but he's pretty clearly calling out the detective that got him on an attempted murder charge in 1989, of which he was eventually cleared. No-knock warrants have been used since the early 1960s by American police forces, from the assassination of Fred Hampton in 1969 to the completely unnecessary execution of Breonna Taylor in 2020, who was shot at 32 times and killed by plainclothes police officers for the crime of living 10 miles away from a suspected drug house. The latter, and many more violent murders like it, were made possible by a 1997 Supreme Court ruling that offered up a lackadaisical definition of the term reasonable suspicion, leading to a significant uptake in the technique's usage. We could go on and on about how many innocent lives the police have destroyed in these unconscionable raids, but what stands out to me is this. Every state that allows no-knock warrants also has stand-your-ground laws. If you kick someone's door in, it doesn't matter who you are or what you are yelling as you enter, the resident is legally allowed to kill you. Here, Snow informs us as to how quickly he goes from being wrongly accused of a crime to becoming a resident of Toronto's East Detention Centre Maximum Security Prison. The school-to-prison pipeline is all too real, even in Canada apparently. 
to be arrested and processed by the American criminal justice system is, in itself, traumatizing. Furthermore, there's no rehabilitation within the system in any way, shape, or form. It's all done through fear. God damn it, this is an upbeat song about police brutality. The piano, horn, and guitar stabs sound like cheesy recreations of reggae music staples, exemplified by the work of dub pioneer King Tubby. Using a mixing board as his instrument, he modded the circuitry to create uniquely spaced out, bass-heavy compositions that could be remixed on the fly. By the mid-1970s, he was credited as producer on hundreds of dancehall tracks. Speaking of old-school reggae, the chorus of this song is said to be inspired by Junior Reed's Foreign Minds, another classic ACAB anthem. So we've got all that going on. Plus the drums from the Fresh Prince theme, just to keep it kid-friendly, I guess. Also credited are two breakbeats, Amen Brother and Assembly Line. Amen Brother will save for the hip-hop video, but Assembly Line is something else. You have to understand that the people that created hip-hop weren't crate-digging for samples and breaks like we do today. They were listening to these politically driven soul and funk songs and heard hip-hop in them. Okay, see? He's literally talking about how he's a smooth lover man and even shouts out his real-life girlfriend at the time. He's doing that because he's about to go away to prison for an undetermined amount of time, but it still adds to the provocative nature of the track. He continues. Um, I'm sorry, what? You guys are still here. It's okay, it's in a three-way. <laughs> that never gets old. Anyway, in the third verse, Snow is even more honest about his lifestyle. Say what you want about appropriation, but this isn't a gimmick for him. Any white guy that confidently says the pure black man is all that I know on a song has already done more for race relations than every other white rapper combined. Except for third base, hip hop's only real white accomplices. But that's another video. Alright, so this is an ACAB anthem where every other verse is about banging chicks. I said before, the guy's getting locked up, cut him some slack. To finish this completely gratuitous fourth verse, which I feel only exists to extend radio airplay, Snow reiterates that this is real shit for him. Hip-hop was created in response to the literal dismantling of poor black communities at the hands of the US government. Despite its commodification by white America, the genre is, and always will be, the cultural representation of the fight for black liberation. No one has ever said that white people cannot or should not contribute to the process of black liberation. People of color are just expressing their hesitations based on their prior experience with white people, which is valid. Up, 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 up. It's valid. Be different. That's all you gotta do. If you're butthurt by someone saying they don't like white people, you are not offering them good faith and still have a lot of racial unpacking to do. Okay, th this is rough. Can we just listen to some more KRS? Ah, that's better. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank the Singleton, Hood, Tull, Phillips, and Washington families for inviting me into their lives during my formative years. I am forever inspired by your patience and wisdom. I also want to put on record that I did not use the N-word pass I was offered. Alright, maybe once, but it felt weird. That shit is a test, don't fall for it. I'm telling you, if your black friend gives you the N-word pass and then invites you to a family gathering, don't, don't fucking say it! Don't, I warned you! Good night, and good luck.